Okay, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Nahmaduhu, Wanusalli Ala Rasuli Hil Kareem, Amma Bad, Salamu Alaikum, Wa Rahmatullahi, Wa Barakat to everyone. Ramadan Mubarak, if you haven't joined us before, this is the first time you're joining us. We're already well into the month of Ramadan. In our previous session or video, we looked at some of the secrets of fasting and the month of Ramadan, and we looked at it through the work of Imam Ghazali. May Allah be pleased with him. Um, in this session, we're going to be looking at the fiqh of fasting. So it's a different science, it's a different genre. And so before I begin, it's worth just reminding all of us that in a traditional madrasa setting, what you'd normally do is that you would first do basic aqidah. So you would establish first and foremost uh, the reason why Islam is the religion to follow. And so therefore you'd have to explain why God exists. You have to explain why we have revelation and why we need revelation. Once you've established that, you then establish why it's important to follow the Quran. So that allows you to establish the obligation of fasting. So that would be the basic level uh, because uh, when you fast, you need to know why you fast. On what basis, what evidence do you have that you need to fast as an example? And what are the consequences in this world and especially in the life to come of failing to respond to the divine address, i.e. the Quran? Once you've done that, the question then arises is, well, how do I fast? What are the conditions of fasting? What breaks a fast? How long should it be for? These sort of questions. And this is when we get into practical matters. So we move from theological, theoretical uh, understanding of Islam, things that are rooted in epistemological sources, to how do we live. So Islam is not just about theory and belief. It's also about amal. It's also about acting in the world. That's very, very important. And fiqh is the realm of where we explore this. And of course, we do this through the Quran. We do this through the sunnah. We do this through a deep engagement and understanding of the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam, and how over 14 centuries, scholarship has understood that practice. So we don't just have this puritanical approach where we say, oh, we just take it from the hadith. Of course, we take it from the hadith. Of course, we take it from the Quran. But... Um, the ulama over 14 centuries, what do you think they were taking from? How do you think they reasoned with it? Do you, do you not think that they knew the Qur'an better than I do? Do you not think that they knew the sunnah better than we do? Because they were closest to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, both in terms of time, but also in terms of their piety and their deep learning. That doesn't mean that we follow them blindly, but what it means is that we trust them. And they have gone through a process. In the modern age, people like to bypass 14 centuries of scholarship. And like one of my teachers said, uh, has written as well, that it's almost a form of backbiting when you ignore scholarship and one pretends that they can somehow um, understand the Prophet's Sunnah without the need of all the tools that we have been developing over the centuries. Uh, and saying that we don't need these ulama anymore. So there's reverence, there's respect. Uh, but there's also an idea that we still engage in scholarship and we can still explore these questions. But uh, the method is very much rooted in a tried and tested method. And this is the mazahib. These are the schools of law, all four of them for us, that have remained uh, until this very day, alhamdulillah. And then you have, uh, once you've done aqidah, once you've done fiqah, well, then you start getting into uh, aesthetics or beauty of Islam or the secrets of Islam. And we started in reverse order because we did Imam Ghazali's uh, discussion first. Uh, so once you've understood belief, the basics of Islam, prove that the existence of God and why the Quran is true, and you understand how to practice what is in the Quran, then you discuss what makes Islam beautiful? What are some of the aesthetically pleasing aspects of Islam? What is the akhlaq of Islam, the ethical, moral virtues that makes Islam such a beautiful religion that it ought to be and that it is in reality? This is important. If you study Islam without these three, then you have a hodgepodge, then you have a mixture and it doesn't cohere, it doesn't make sense. So that's why it's really, really important that one studies Islam holistically. They study all the sciences, and a sign of a exemplary scholar is someone who is able to bring all of this together in its right place, and Allah knows best. 
So let's begin, inshallah ta'ala, in this session where we are doing the fiqh of uh, fasting. This is the practical aspects of our fasting. And of course, we're going to be following the Hanafi madhab in particular here. There are other madhab and we are aware of them and we have respect towards them also. Um, I'm taking this from the slides uh, directly. Uh, from my friend Mufti Muaz Chetty, may Allah preserve him, a very talented young Mufti um, who also happens to teach at a Darul Uloom here. And um, he is someone that I trust in his learning and his scholarship. So I've looked at his slides and I've just used his slides because uh, it pretty much captures everything that I would have liked to talk about. And he summarizes it quite well. Um, and of course, uh, this should be sufficient and these slides will be sl shared with you. Um, at the end, so you can access them if you want you to have them for your own personal reference. So, usually we talk about the virtues, the fadail of the month of Ramadan. I'm not going to go too much into this because time is not on our side. Um, but the month of uh, the Ramadan is obviously tied with the Quran, which was revealed what's called on this lawh mahfuz, this sacred tablet. Um, and it was brought down to this earthly realm. Um, and it is in the month of Ramadan when revelation, the final revelation, began. Um, and it, of, of course, was revealed primarily upon the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So we also know that in this month through hadith, that when we do virtuous actions in this month, their status is enhanced, if you like, for want of a better phrase. So we should try and do as much good as we can in this month, insha'Allah ta'ala. Um, and Ramadan is also not just for enhancing our deeds, it's also for purifying our past transgressions. And of course, any minor sins that we've done, inshallah, they'll be forgiven. But for major sins, we must seek atonement. We must seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But because we are Hanafis and we are also hukuk maximalists, what does that mean? We are also very, very careful about honoring their dignity and respecting others' rights. If we have done a sin which involves the violation of the rights of a fellow human being, then we ought to seek forgiveness from that person if they are still alive. Okay, um, And we know that the doors of Jannah are open, i.e. this is a meaning that doors of paradise are open for those who seek it. They will get into Jannah, inshallah ta'ala, if they work to please Allah in this month. And the doors of Jahannam are shut and the devil is chained. This has many meanings and there are some meanings here. Uh, one can mean that the main generals uh, are chained up. So the chain of command is disrupted from the devils. Um, or that uh, the influence of the nafs, the lower self, Amaratun Bisu, um, is usually attacked by the shaitan in the month throughout the year, in fact. But uh, we have an opportunity to retrain the nafs, gain its strength once again. Okay, And of course, fasting is a pillar of our religion, i.e. it's a fundamental of our religion. Anyone who denies the obligation of fasting in the month of Ramadan leaves the fold of Islam. It's a different matter if someone fails to fast, um, but the idea to negate something, to have agency to negate something, means that you leave the fold of Islam. And the Prophet ﷺ has many, many ahadiths of uh, the importance of uh, fasting, uh, sins being forgiven. So it's really for our benefit. <clears throat> and I, this slide will go into much more details. There are those of Jannah, especially Rayyan, which is open for those who fast in the month of Ramadan. Um, of course, when a person wants to seek entry, success, they will try every avenue to ensure that they can be successful. So fasting is one of the eight avenues that we can tick off, inshallah, to increase our rate of success, inshallah, of getting into Jannah, which is what we want to achieve ultimately in the end because of all of this. Um, so... The obligation of fasting is established in the Quran. I want to add one more thing as well, and this is not here in the slides. It's mentioned by Imam Ibn al-Arabi, rahimahullah ta'ala, in his Futuhat al makiya And other ulama talk about this idea also. So uh, Imam Ghazali, in his Ihya Ulumuddin, in Kitab al -Hub, talks about this idea that fasting is also something that is unique in the sense that Allah will give you the reward for it, as we know in the Hadith. 
um, the reward is being kept by Allah. So what is the meaning of this? So, so they say that <clears throat> fasting in some ways resembles the attributes of Allah. And we know in our understanding that the more you try to imitate the sifat of Allah, certain attributes of Allah, the closer you draw to Him. Because Allah is perfect. Allah is completely uh, free of any need. Allah doesn't need anyone. He has complete power. He's omnipotent. He's omnipresent. Jalla wa ala. And so the, to the extent that we try and imitate some of these attributes of God, we draw closer to Him. There's a relationship. So fasting, in many ways, for a few hours for all of us, is this idea of staying away from food, staying away from uh, drink, sexual relations, all these things which are otherwise permissible for us, and we do it for His pleasure. But there's also a deeper meaning, which is that God, Allah, is summoned. He doesn't need anyone. He is free of any need. Um, so we resemble God, in, or we imitate Allah to the extent that we stay away from these things. And because of that, we come close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's a secret that the ulama talk about, and I think it's a very, very fascinating insight the, the, that the ulama who have deep insight and connection to Allah have revealed to us. And it creates a dimension which is deeply spiritual in fasting. And the reason I started with this in the first 10 minutes is to emphasize that when we study fiqh, uh, there's always a moral, ethical, a spiritual dimension to it. One should not think of fiqh as just a bunch of rules. That's a reductive understanding of fiqh. Uh, so we fast. Uh, Allah mentions in the Quran why we fast. He gives the ta'lil, if you like, the reason. لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ that you might have uh, this idea of taqwa, God consciousness, being wary, aware of Allah. And this is a form of love for Allah as well, because ultimately we love Allah because He is Allah, because He provides for us. Even when we have friends who do good to us, they only do it because Allah has inspired them to do good to us. When we do good to somebody and they love us, they love us not because there's something inherently good about us per se, it's because Allah has placed in us the ability to do good for someone. So ultimately, Allah is the cause for everything and Allah is the reason for our love. We should love Allah only, as in our ultimate love should be for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We love what Allah loves, i.e. the Prophet and the ulama and the mashayikh. It's also a, a form of shukr, to be grateful. So fasting allows you to be grateful for what you have, um, the gifts that you have, in that in reality you will never be able to account, count the gifts, the bestowals Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to you. So you should always be in a state of shukr. And of course, the opposite, the opposite the, of um, shukr is kufr. Uh, one meaning of kufr among, among the many meanings is ungratefulness. Uh, to deny what is obviously in front of you, to deny the manifest truth. But it also has this idea of being ungrateful. God gave you so much, it's so obvious that there is a creator who gave you this. How could you show kufr? How could you be ungrateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Rather, shukr is the default position of a believer. Okay, uh, And there are other things that you should avoid, sins in all its forms, because this is the month of taqwa. Um, and it's a month of recitation of the Qur'an. We should try and recite the Qur'an more so in the month of Ramadan. It's also the month of dua. Uh, we should supplicate to Allah, seek His forgiveness, draw closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a month of charity. Uh, one should give as much charity as they are able to do so, especially um, with the situation that we see across the world. And there are many ulama who would uh, recite the Qur'an uh, abundantly in the month of Ramadan. So spend as much time uh, as you can in the month of Ramadan reciting the Quran. Okay, so let's get into some of the technical details. Uh, fasting, it, in terms of its definition, is to abstain from food uh, and drink, it's to abstain from conjugal relations, from true dawn, subasadiq, until sunset. And you have to have an intention of fasting. 
um, by someone obligated to fast, someone who has an obligation to fast. And of course, this is established in the Quran, obligation to fast in the month of Ramadan, in Surah Baqarah. And there are verses that tell you, فَمَنْ شَهِدَ مِنْكُمُ الشَّهْرَ فَلْيَسُمْ One should fast when they find the month of Ramadan. Okay. Um, so who is this obligation upon? This is the first type thing that we always establish. Who is fasting for? Well, um, a Muslim, of course, uh, a mature person, though children should not be forced, though encouraged. So if your child wants to fast, or they are reaching the age of balagha, uh, um, bulugh, then um, they should be encouraged to fast, or you can gently encourage to fast, then maybe half a fast, and so forth, and so on. So they're getting ready for fasting. Uh, but one does not force something upon people that is not an obligation upon them. This is an important usul. Um, but at the same time, you should gently encourage them. Fasting is also an uh, obligation upon a sane person. Uh, and this explains the reason why there's no fidya or qada upon an insane person. So they don't need to pay a fidya or a qada. And these are these three conditions here are simply known as conditions of obligation. Conditions of obligation. What obligates you? And then there are another set of obligations. These are the obligations of performance, i.e. You've, you've met the minimum threshold. When do you perform them? Um, so once you meet the first three conditions I've just outlined, then um, when these conditions are met, then a person must fast on time. So you must be healthy. Uh, this is why people who are unwell, may Allah give shifa to all of those who are unwell, uh, they must perform qada or pay fidya. Right, so if they are not well, then they have to do qada or fidya. Um, if you are non-menstruating uh, and uh, are not in lokia or postnatal bleeding, um, then you have to fast. This is why women must perform qada of misfast. So if they miss a fast because they were in postnatal bleeding or lokia, um, then they perform the qada after the month of Ramadan. And you have to be a resident, so you're not traveling basically. Um, so the traveler, for example is allowed to avoid fasting, but they must keep the qada afterwards. Okay, they don't need to do kafara. But so these are conditions of obligation. If they are not met, then you have qada or fidya. There's no kafara, qada or fidya. Okay, what is fidya? Some of you will ask me what is fidya. Fidya is a form of atonement. Um, it's a very Christian word, uh, atonement, but we're using it because it kind of gets the message across. Um, so if you're a person or someone who is unable to fast and has no hope of getting better such that uh, they would be able to fast, um, even if it's in the winter period, so in the UK, for example, here, it's very short, days are very short in winter, then you have to give a fidya for each fast. The Prophet Sallallahu has outlined this, this is mentioned in the Musannad uh, of uh, Ibn Abi Shayba. Um, and it's around three pounds, uh, ulama will give you different, your scholars will give you the various prices, but it's about three pounds in charity for each fast. Um, and you should could be considered about where you give it and um, how you distribute it. That should be also considered, inshallah. Okay. Um, and um, so we'll come back to that. Um, if you don't have the financial capability to give fidya, you might not have that money, then you should make istighfar. So, first of all, you try and give a financial compensation. Then you make istighfar. Um, but say, for example, you give fidya um, for your fast, and later you you recovered. You became better. Uh, you recovered from your illness. Then you will be required to make a qaza. Okay? Because the whole idea of fidya is that there's you, you're atoning for something that you can't you can't do that fast. Okay? And the fidya should not be given before Ramadan, but once Ramadan starts. Okay? And you can give it in fidya for the entire month. Okay, what are some of the conditions needed before the fast in order for it to be valid? Well, one of the things is that you need to have intention, niyyah, uh, because it's a ibadah to mustaqilla, it's a ibadah in of itself. Therefore, intention is a condition. Um, of course, you need to be, like I mentioned, you need to be pure uh, from the state of menstruation or lakia. And there should be an absence of anything that invalidates your fast, which we'll talk about, inshallah. So, um, if you are fasting in the month of Ramadan, the type of fast that you need to have is a general intention, which you need to make before true dawn uh, until midday, which is usually halfway between true dawn and sunset. 
and you need to do it every day. Um, this is a whole fiqh discussion around um, is it a whole month of Ramadan? Is it each fast? We won't go into it. Um, but for a month of Ramadan, for the fasting of Ramadan, you need to make attention for each fast and you should do it before um, true dawn. Okay. Um, and you can do it before true dawn until shari midday. So you have until midday to make the intention. When it's a qaza fast, so say you missed the fast and you're now keeping one outside of the month of Ramadan or a kafara fast, um, then you have to make the intention before true dawn. So you actually have to make it in the morning. For Ramadan, you have until midday, simply put. Um, now, this is like an usul. This is like a principle that will help you, inshallah, to uh, ensure the validity of fasting during the fast itself. Okay, so when you're fasting, you started the fast, the month of Ramadan or the day has begun, you should avoid putting any discernible item into a uh, hole, which I'll talk about, um, and allowing it to reach a resident hole. So entering, you should avoid something, entering something and settling in a resident hole and staying there. Okay, except if this happens by mistake. So I'll give an example in a moment of that. Um, and if you do this in a severe manner, like your your intention of doing it is qaza and kafara, there'll be both for you. Okay. Intention I'll talk about. Um, no, intention doesn't have to be done verbally. Mere recognition of the fact that your fasting is sufficient. You don't have to say there's nothing specifically that you have to say. You can if you want to, but just merely intending is enough. Okay. Now sometimes people get a little bit confused uh, between um doing something forgetfully and accidentally. So I will explain this for you, inshallah ta'ala. It's a very simple explanation, don't worry. Um, if you do something that invalidates fasting while completely forgetting that you're fasting, then the fast is still valid. So you do something uh, that invalidates it. And um, you know you, you eat something. You didn't know that you're not, you're not supposed to be eating right now. You just put it in completely out of a state of forgetfulness, then your fast doesn't break. And this is based on the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that a person who eats forgetfully during Ramadan is fed by Allah. So in other words, your fast continues. So if you drink something thinking that uh, you just you just completely forgot, you just didn't know, you just forgot for that moment that you know you weren't you you were fasting, you weren't meant to be consuming anything. Then it's fine. Okay. Now, if a person does. On, on, a, on a different level, if a person does one of two types of acts that invalidate fasting accidentally, which means that you know you're fasting, you're, you're, not, you're not forgetful, but you know that you're fasting, but accidentally you do something, um, you actually commit one of the two types of acts that invalidate fast, then the fast will break, though there will be no kafara. So this is an example. Say you're uh, doing, you're gargling your mouth. Now when you're gargling, you know you're fasting, so you're not forgetfulness. Um, but you accidentally swallow some water, the fast will break, but there's no kafara. So your fast will break because there's no forgetfulness here. You're not falling within the realm of the hadith and the understanding of forgetfulness, but you're doing it at, at basically care, carelessness. Uh, and so one should be really, really careful when they perform these acts. Okay. Now, before I talked about in the previous slide about this condition here in the red box, which is a guiding principle about what breaks a fast, is that something discernible, like a, an item, uh, enters a hole and you allow it directly uh, reach a resident hole and it stays there, um, this breaks the fast, of course, except in the case of the forgetful person fasting, which I just already outlined for you. So let me give you examples of it. These are the most common ones, okay? Now remember the condition, my friends, is that it must directly reach into a resident hole and stay there. So one of the holes that you have, entry points, if you like, is your mouth, obviously. And so if it goes into your mouth and then it enters your throat, right, and uh, your fast breaks. If something enters your nose and, it, and then it moves to your stomach, it breaks. If uh, something enters the ear, um, usually if you have a hole in your drum, eardrum, uh, and it enters the throat, it breaks. If you have some sort of abdominal puncture and um, and it enters uh, the stomach or intestine, then it breaks. So it has to move from here to here, here to here. This is like a legal meaning that we have in fiqh, which I won't go into, but it's like a this is like a good guide 
of uh, reasoning through the Quran and the Sunnah and the Hadith. Okay, but remember this point. It all comes down to this discernible item, entering the entry hole, i.e. your mouth, for example, and then reaching a, res uh, 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 reaching a resident hole, such as the throat in this example, and staying there. So that's quite clear, I think. Um, now, there are things that nullify the fast, uh, and they are, they if they do, there's, there's two types of consequences. One is qaza, and one is kafara. Okay, so this is of two types. So to deliberately, knowingly, so it's not by happen by accident, knowingly, uh, you don't forget about it, you put some discernible item, you put some food in the, in your mouth, for example, and it benefits the body. So there's some sort of benefit. And these words underline are very, very important. These are like conditions. Deliberately, knowingly, discernible item, some size, and it benefits the body into the mouth. So in this example, it's the whole, um, by yourself. So you've done it yourself. Nobody forced you to do it. Right, and we don't have a valid reason, and it reaches the throat because it's moved from the mouth, right? It's entered through here and it's reached the throat. Then, um, this is one type, okay? Um, so for example, eating normal food, you have a crisp or a chocolate or something deliberately and knowingly without any need, okay? So, this is something that's important, um. And usually what necessitates a qaza but not a kafara is when a person puts something discernible into an entry hole. So this would be for kafara. So we have to do qaza and kafara. But what for qaza is basically you have to just repeat the fast after, outside after the month of Ramadan. This is when a person puts a discernible item into an entry hole such that it directly reaches the resident hole in a matter different to the one. So basically, this is, um, if I can explain it in other terms, this description here in... Um, in bold is what it has to be fulfilled it, it, it's this is exactly what needs to happen basically for kafara if it doesn't happen in this perfect way when i mean perfect i mean in a negative sense if it doesn't happen in this perfect sense then there's a kafara then there's a qaza only kafara is when you do it deliberately knowingly it's a size of an item you're benefiting from it it enters uh, an entry hall and settles in a resident hall doing it deliberately basically uh it's like just it's a Worst type of um, crime, if you like, when it comes to fasting. And qaza is um, only for if it doesn't fulfill this level. So, in other words, kafara comes about really because you've really gone out of your way to break this fast, like really invalidate this fast. And so there's a sort of mercy in this, but sort of reminding ourselves that um, one should not um, be careless in their fasting. Okay. I'm going to come to the example of burping and food coming out. Okay. So, what breaks the fast, um, or breaks of the fast, so qaza and kafara come together, they come as a pair. So if you have kafara, you'll have to do qaza. So it's not just kafara, you also have to uh, make up the fast. To deliberately, not accidentally, and knowingly, not forgetfully put a discernible item which benefits the body into the mouth entry by oneself without a sharia excuse, such that it reaches the throat. So if you think about what uh, one of the questions that we had uh, from someone, is that if someone burps, um, and it comes up, um, this would not at least not fulfill the criteria for kafara. So you know there's no kafara here because there's no deliberate and uh, there's no de de there's no deliberate uh, intention there. Maybe qaza, so we'll come to that. And qaza is to put a discernible item to enter your hole and allow it to reach your resident hole. So we talked about this. What is the kafara? So say you went full and it, it, you violated the fasting in all the ways that we've mentioned, then there is a list, if you like. Uh, the first one is you have to fast 60 days consecutively, uh, and you can't miss a single day. Okay, so it's really, you know, it's a really strong violation, can you see? It's a strong violation. Um, if a single day is missed, uh, even if it's due to Eid day or the days of Tashrik in which fasting is prohibited, then, the, then you have to start again. So you really, really have to, you know, uh, make sure that you're going to fast for 60 days. Um, if you have an inter interruption from menstruation, this is excusable uh, as long as the person fasts immediately after the menstruation ends. Uh, if you're not able to fast due to illness, then you go to for then you got to feed 60 poor people two filling meals uh, or a payment equivalent to that. Okay. Um, and 
the fara only applies to fasting um, in the month of uh, Ramadan fast. No other fast. It doesn't apply to any other type of fast. Okay. Um, now, if a person's fast breaks, uh, you must still refrain from eating or drinking until the time of iftar. This is the adab of fasting. So it doesn't mean now that if you've broken your fast, uh, you kind of just start indulging in food. No, you maintain uh, as though you were fasting. What are the breakers of fast? So asthma pump, inhaler, oral tablets. If you think about the principle that I've outlined, um, they should all be um, they should all be clear. Yes, Mariam, that should be the rule. Uh, oral tablets, accidentally swallowing food or drink, so toothpaste, because you knew you were fasting and you weren't careful. Swallowed blood, blood. so if equal to or more than saliva based on color. Um, so if it's swallowed blood and it's more than the saliva based on the color, then the fast breaks. Uh, this particular entry, uh, and if it enters through an entry hole, endoscopy, and it reaches the resident hole. This is a principle that we've been out If you follow this principle, you'll be fine. Gastron gastronomy, um, this is medication to stomach from the abdomen, again, because of that principle. And a tube that goes into the intestine, same idea. It's entered, it's entered the resident hole. Nasal spray, breaks the fast. Uh, rectal supp suppositories, so medication through the anus, again, because something's entering and going to those places. Um, any device that enters down the throat, if it has lubricant on it, so lubricant is important here. The occurrence of menstruation, so if, if menstruation break, starts, the fast breaks. And then there are um, other things, swallowing the spit of one's partner during kissing, because that's a foreign um, item that's entered. Uh, tears of sweat that go down the throat if they are in large quantity, because of this idea of sizable proportion. Um, smoking when inhaled deliberately, uh, for example, um, if you're using VIX, that enters. Anema, swallowing leftover food in the mouth, which is equivalent to or larger than the size of a chickpea. So this is the answer to your question, uh, Rokeya, yeah, that uh, if you swallow leftover food in the mouth, it kind of helps. Um, we'll come back to that one in a second as well in more detail, inshallah. And there are other things like eye drops, uh, nicotine patch, uh, suruma, if this enters into the throat. So it's always about Remember, if you put suma in your eyes and it kind of, you feel it in your throat, it's broken the fast because it's reached from one place to another. Okay. Dialysis and these sort of things. Um, sorry, I've got this wrong. These are things that don't break the fast. So let me go back. Um, let me go back. Acupuncture, surma, these things don't break the fast. Yes, unless it reaches from one entry point to the residential point. Um, nicotine patch doesn't break the fast. Uh, of course, one should quit smoking. And if they're using that as a, Way to quit smoking, inshallah. That's good. Blood transfusions, applying cream or lotion or Vicks, cupping, um, endoscopy, which doesn't which doesn't go for an empty hole. Um, these sort of things. Drips, uh, glucose or saline drips. Um, swallowing food stuck in the mouth that's less than chickpea size doesn't break the fast. Incense, uh, be careful with them. I don't think we use them as much, but when I was a child, my father would have them. As long as it's not deliberately inhaled, okay? Makeup as, such as lipstick, it's fine. Applying oil to the head or body, so for the men who like to look after their beards, they should do, this is fine. Uh, ultrasound, using a miswag, showering, smelling food, testing, uh, medication in certain places, uh, swallowing food left over in the mouth, so be chickpea. Okay, so some are frequently asked questions for you, inshallah. Breastfeeding women. So if you happen to be breastfeeding, and you have a strong belief that by fasting it will cause harm to the baby, uh, then you can avoid fasting and perform qaza later on. Okay, because we don't jeopardize in our sharia, we don't cause harm to ourselves and to others. Okay, remember in Hanafi, in Hanafi madhab, the sanctity of a life is very, very, very sacred. It's, it's optimum. Um, I teach this to my students regularly. Um, and sometimes you know this through personal experience uh, or medical expertise. Um, they may tell you that, you know, it's not a good idea for you to fast. Then that's enough for you. That's a sufficient reason for, for you not to fast. I know some women do fast. Uh, I know some women don't. Uh, it just depends on your personal experience, okay? So you just work out what's best for you. Brushing your teeth with toothpaste does not break the fast. Remember what I said? Um, what breaks the fast is the toothpaste or the water 
entering the hole and then going to a settling point, in this case with the mouth through the throat. So then it would break the fast. That's why you have to be careful because you know you're fasting when you're brushing your teeth. You can't brush your teeth, but you just have to be careful. So remember the principle. Remember the principle. Go always back to the principle. Um, deodorant spray or smoke from cooked food. Um, if you consciously take in smoke from a deodorant um, spray or cooked food, your fast will become invalid. Um, there'll be qaza no kafara. If it goes passively, that's fine. So if you just happen to be, you know, walking through the kitchen and it smells, that's different. But trying to take benefit from it consciously because you're doing something is very much tied to this idea of what we describe in kafara, which is that you're going out of your way to do something. Okay. Dental treatment. So you might go to the dentist in the month of Ramadan. Um, the treatment itself doesn't validate the fast. Um, but sometimes, in many cases, I mean, my wife's a dentist, you do end up swallowing things. And so this breaks the fast. So if you can't delay dental treatment, okay, unless it's an emergency. If you're simply just checking the mouth, then that's fine. Um, if, you're, if your menstruation begins during the day, you must break your fast. Okay. If your menstruation on the other side ends during the day, um, you avoid eating for the remainder of the day. Okay. Um, but she must make qada for that fast, even if the menstruation ended before the midday. Okay. Vomiting. So vomiting will only break the fast in two scenarios. A person invol involuntarily vomits a mouth. So you haven't induced it, right? And you know that you're fasting and actually swallows the vomit again. So then what happens is vomit comes out, a mouthful. You have no control of it. You know you're fasting and then you swallow the vomit again. You're supposed to not bring it back in again. Because what's happened is that substance has gone from the entry point back into the residential point. Remember this principle. This principle is always working here. Yeah? Apply the principle, my friends, you'll be fine. Um, or you you voluntarily vomit a mouth. In other words, you induced yourself knowing that you're fasting. So one, there's two scenarios. One is that it happens involuntary. You vomit, you, you had no control over it. You should have left the body. But for one reason or another, it's a mouthful. It's a mouthful. And then it enters. You bring it back in again. This breaks your fast. Or you induce it. You, you make yourself vomit, knowing that you're fasting. Right? That breaks the fast. Um, okay, so... Um, Sunnahs of fasting... Uh, so we've done the fiqh, this is some of the sunnahs of fasting. Of course, we should do the suhoor, and you should try and delay the suhoor just before true dawn. You should, on the other side, you should break the fast as soon as you can after sunset. Don't delay. You could use something sweet to break your fast, dates or zamzam if available, but don't kill yourself over it if you don't have it. You know, you don't have to kill yourself over it. Uh, to restrain yourself from all sins. Um, and, you know, eat, eat, eat. It's, 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 it's a virtue in our tradition not to eat too much, to eat carefully. Okay, uh, What are some of the detestable acts of fasting? They don't break the fast, but it goes against the idea of fasting. Uh, to taste or chew food without a need or to brush one's teeth with toothpaste. If you don't need to do it, don't do it. But if you feel that you need to brush your teeth because you're going to work and you don't want to give the cleave to your work colleagues, cause harm, that's different. To gather and swallow saliva, right? Uh, not a good idea. Um, to do anything that would weaken one to such an extent that he would have to break it. To do anything that makes your fast difficult for you, right? To overburden yourself, to tire yourself out. Um, when you're doing wazu, be careful when you're doing goggling and putting water in your nose. So you still have to do it, but uh, be careful in how you do it. Uh, uh, in, in many cultures, they still light the incense sticks. Uh, we try and avoid it because of the, of the consequences that I mentioned before. Um, of course, some of the major sins, we've already talked about this before, is uh, to backbite, lie, and commit sins such as arguing and fighting. So they don't break the fast, but they don't make your fast. Um, you know, fasting is a spiritual state, so you have to be in a spiritual state when you're fasting. And I think I'll end there. Maybe.